I took a cue from Reverend Dorr during, I think, I forget which class it was, but she had mentioned that we knew very little about Andrew Jackson Davis. So we'll talk a little bit about him, and then we'll talk a little bit about one of his books that he wrote. It's, I draw most of this from uh, a series of lectures on death and the dying that he published in 1911. But we know Davis from our basic book as being a clairvoyant who, whose abilities were discovered through mesmerism and an entry in his journal, Brother, the good work has begun. Behold, a living demonstration is born. And we also know that, that he formed the first spiritualist lyceum. But I'm not sure if we know that he was, he had gone through a few operators during his career as a, a, a clairvoyant under their direction, because eventually he was able to do this on his own. But he began in 1843 with Professor Grimes. He and a group of his, his friends went to visit him, and he attempted to, to mesmerize him. And as he was doing that, uh, Grimes said, you're getting sleepier. And Davis said, well, I don't know about you, but I'm not. So that attempt had failed. That was his first attempt. The second attempt was a few weeks later with a Dr. Levingston. And then when Levingston came into the shoe store where he was apprenticed at, he started talking about mesmerism and asked Davis if he'd had any experience with it. And Davis said, well, you know, I, yeah, but it didn't work. So Levingston invited him over and thus began his career as a clairvoyant. And his first book, Nature's Divine Revelations, is the result of those early lectures. But he did more as a clairvoyant under their guidance. He was a healing medium. He would give instructions on how to, to make cures. I don't want to say cures, but treatments for illnesses and such. And he did this for a number of years, but I'm starting to get ahead of myself. So I want to come back to what Davis has to say about dying. We're going to begin with that. So as I said, in 1911, he published a series of evening lectures. They were about the Summerland. And the Summerland is a place for souls to gather. And in his first lecture, he talks about his experience of watching someone go through the dying process. And he begins with a light that begins to form. And what the person feels, the sensations they feel. And he tells us that they feel this sense of cold that begins at the feet, perhaps the toes. And as this halo begins to form, it moves up the body slowly. And as it moves, this is, this is the soul beginning its, its extraction from its entanglement, its disentanglement, I should say, from the body. And when it gets to the heart area, when it gets to this area right here, all of a sudden this, this glow, which could be just very small, begins to get larger and larger. And what happens? Here's the question and answer part. What happens with the heart? Why would it do that? We're talking about the dying process. And Davis is telling us that there's this this light that begins to form over us. He describes it as a halo. And it begins, I'm assuming it begins at the feet, because he doesn't tell us where it begins. He just tells us 
that the feet are cold. So we make an assumption that this light is beginning to form at the feet. And it moves slowly upward along the body. And when it gets to the heart area, it pauses for a moment. And then it expands. And I'm curious as to what your thoughts would be as to why it would stop there and pause and then grow larger. My suspicions is that it does that because at the heart chakra in the heart area, when you are dying, that's that's all you have to give, and you're going into love. It's got to it's it's got to have it's got to be compatible with where we're going. That's the highest frequency. You know what resides in the heart. It's, well, what responds first to the emotions, strong emotions that we experience? What responds first to that? You get angry, there's that quickening of the heart. You get happy, there's that quickening of the heart. The heart interprets all our emotions that we receive before it's sent out to the rest of the body. So it would make sense that when that, that, that light, that halo begins to move over us, that it pauses there and expands because that's the seat of our emotions. This is what science tells us because when we are happy and having fun and enjoying ourselves, those heart rhythms are are nice and strong and steady, harmonious. But when we get angry or frustrated, those, those heart rhythms become disharmonious. So it's a thought. And, and Pat and Reverend Bacon and Laura all have great ideas with that. And this just supplements that. It's something for you to think about because this heart plays an important role. And it seems that it's important during this process as well. So as this, as this light is moving over us, Davis tells us that we are aware of this process. When we're going through this process, he tells us that we are aware of it. So there's nothing there that explains what that person may be feeling. But knowing that when we go through this experience, it's not going to be something that's just that quick. It's an experience no different than life. It's, it's part of our process. And as this, as this emanation of light continues, it rests right here. This is the last organ that lets go of the soul. The brain is the last organ that lets it go. So that's one experience that he tells us about. Another one that I found fascinating. Now, if you remember, da Jackson Davis lived during the Civil War. So he was able to visit those fields. And in one of his, his lectures, he tells us about how he, he saw this, this soldier through his clairvoyant abilities, how he saw this soldier being flung into the air because of a cannon, a cannonball that had flung it into the air. He doesn't tell us about what happens to the body, but he tells us that over top this battlefield are these light bodies, or what I interpret as light bodies, soldier, all kinds of soldiers. And as they're there, you know, we have to remember, if you get flung by a, a, a cannon, chances are you're going to lose some limbs. But 
when they're above this battlefield, in this light body, these the the soul extracts itself from these other limbs. It it disentangles itself from flesh and bone. And he watched these bodies. He watched these people. I shouldn't refer to them as bodies because they're people. He watched these people reshape, reform, become new. Even those who may have experienced an amputation years ago, the soul, that light body, extracted itself from those from the flesh and bone of wherever it was at and returned and made the person whole. Now, I find this fascinating, especially since what research has been doing today. And they tell us, they've, they've seen how if you lose a limb, that, that light body of ours, it's still there. It's still attached. It's, it's amazing because he wrote this in 1911, and almost over 100 years later, science backs it up. That's the nice thing about spiritualism and the science that, that's going on, how we can come together. It's fascinating. Now, I would like to share with you, before we go into the summer land, I would like to share with you an experience. And then I'll ask if any of you have had similar experiences. A brother made his transition this past summer. And while he was in hospice, I visited him. And while I was holding his hand, this was before I'd even read this. While I was holding his hand, I closed my eyes and I put myself in that, that receptive state. And I was, and as I gazed at him, I saw his body laying there in the bed. And I also saw this light coming out of his navel like an umbilical cord. And this this shape that looked like a womb or an egg, and within it was his body. And, and he was in a fetal position, no different than, than a fetus within a woman who is, is curled up, gathering its strength, gathering its, its nurturing itself. It was, I felt this experience was a privilege. Now, I wasn't there during the rest of the process, but just that little bit was, was enough to, to know that I had made the right choice being involved in this religion. Now, Davis has a lot of books that are based on letters that he received. He would receive letters from all across the nation. I imagine he even got some from across the ocean, too. And one of these letters asked him about the transition from the earth to the summerland. And this was his response. The passage from this, from this sphere into the next is no more a change to the individual than a journey from America to England accepting the almost complete emancipation consequent upon the change from rudimental misdirection and earthly imperfections. Well, that says a lot. It tells me that, that when I disentangle myself from this body, I'm going to be the same person when I Make the journey. And it's something to take comfort in. So he also tells us, he also tells us that we should take the time to investigate the summerland or these realms of the souls. That we should take the time to, to either through mediumship or through clairvoyance or through reading 
take the time to familiarize ourselves because he looks at it like this. He explains it like this. When you go to visit some place, a distant land, distant state, distant country, typically, I don't know about you, but typically I will look and see what's in the area. I'll get familiar with the area somehow. Or even, even enlist a guide when I get there. And he implies that this is no different than with the summer land, that you should, should take the time to, to find out what's going on there, what's needed there. These are things that he suggests. And as he begins his description, the first thing he tells us is that, that when you gaze upon the summer land, there's no air pollution to blur the images. There's no air pollution to cloud up what you see. Nothing like what we're accustomed to here. Even with, with HD TV, you know, and you've got that crispness there. But he describes this as being something more, as though this is the the summerland is the essence of earth or of any other place. He also tells us that those who reside in the summerland may not necessarily be from this earth. He tells us that, that beings from across the universe gather here. Now, myself, I don't follow a lot of the UFO stuff, mostly because it doesn't interest me. But there is enough evidence to support the idea. I don't disagree with it. But can you imagine, can you imagine being in the southern land and Worf taps you on the shoulder? I find that fascinating. And he also tells us that, that, you know, we teach that the personality survives death, that the soul is that essence of personality. And he tells us that, that our habits may remain the same when we step into the Summerland, because he describes these areas of communities. You know, if anybody's been to a big city, there's always Little Italy somewhere. There was in Philadelphia. I think there is in Chicago as well. Little Italy or Greek town. No. But the difference is over there, it doesn't matter what creed or ethnicity you may be because you're welcomed just the same. And he also tells us that some people, when they step into the Summerland, they they get themselves wrapped up in memories. And some of them choose to stay there. We do that here. A lot of us will live in the past, especially after a loved one has transitioned because we're not ready to let go of them. So, so we see them in everything. My brother helps me when I'm working on the church because I have his tools. And when I visit with my mother, I tell her, yeah, Mike helped me do this at the church. Or, or Mike gave me a recipe for this because I've got his cookbooks. You know, I talk about him as though he's still here, which in the whole scheme of the whole belief of the continuity of life is part of that whole thing. But that's another talk. I don't want to get caught up in that. But and he also tells us that there, there are other avenues to continue your progress. He tells us there are universities and colleges there for us to attend to. It's, 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 in a lot of ways, it's no different than here, but it's much better. He also tells us 
And this is something else that I find very comforting. He tells us that experience is premium. It's, it's what allows us to grow. And he tells us that, that those who, who may have only been here a short time and had, didn't have the benefit of experiencing life, they're nurtured there by other souls. He also tells us, well, not him in particular, but other spiritualist authors tell us that some of these souls that are there that, that we call, that like to get into trouble and stuff, they call them immature souls. And they say that they will sit with us in circles. And when they sit with us in circles, they're learning, they're getting that experience that they were unable to have here. We often say there's a joy guide with this. That could very well be one of those little children in the Summerland that are walking behind us, doing their thing, but learning as well because they didn't have that benefit. There's so much there. He talks about those who, who have experienced long protracted illnesses. And if our habits go with us, it would seem that that having a long illness, we would become comfortable in being ill. We become comfortable as we age with the infirmities that our bodies develop. Mine happens to be the brain. It gets a little fatigued and I have to work around it. I've become so accustomed to it. In fact, so much so that I make allowances for it. And I'm assuming that it's very much the same for others who experience these long illnesses. So when they do make their transition, you know, this has become part of their being, part of their habit. And even though the body is no longer with them, there's still that belief that has to that has to be changed that has to to evolve and what do we have here to help us do that we have mental health practitioners that help us work through these difficult emotional or mental problems that we experience here it would it would make sense to have something similar there, which is what he tells us. And it's not to it's not to work out things with the body. No, it's to help us become acclimatized to the area. Because when we go someplace new, I don't know about you, but when I go someplace new, I don't know what to do. As I said earlier, I've been doing these talks like this for over 20 years, and I still get nervous. It's just there. So it would make sense that there are these places there to help us when we are, are when we disentangle ourselves from these bodies to help us acclimatize to the Summerland. I'd like to take this moment to share another experience that's that's tied with with my brother's passing. Now, before the incident I described earlier, I was was presented a dream. And in this dream, I'm assuming I had a glimpse of the summerland because the what I experienced is exactly what he described. Everything was, was so much clearer. It wasn't like a regular dream. You know, with a regular dream, you focus on something and the edges begin to blur. This dream was not like that. Everything was clear. It was though I could breathe in the air. It was that crisp. And I'm in this room. It's a one-bedroom apartment, essentially. And within it, are his pets. He had a Doberman that he enjoyed. His, 
He had a little Pekingese that he enjoyed, and there was a cat. Now, I didn't know about the cat. I knew about the two dogs, but I didn't know about the cat. And when I shared this with my mother, she said, yeah, he had a cat that he liked, that he really enjoyed. It was midnight, I think she said it was. But I was shown that. And I also watched a gentleman come in because I could look out the window. And outside at the window was this courtyard and the, the grass was nice and crisp. There was, it was as though you could see each of the blades. And this gentleman came in and introduced himself. And when I awoke from this dream, I knew what it was. I had been granted permission to see this, this mansion that had been prepared for him. Because that's what we're told. There are mansions prepared for us. And I was able to see this. Well, I shared this during our service. And one of, my, one of our parishioners had a family relative that had, had took their own life. And when I shared this dream with them, and how I interpreted it with them, they, they felt they were comforted because they, they were comforted by the idea that there was people there to care for this person, to help them work through whatever had caused them, whatever reason was given to them to, to take their own life. And they drew comfort from that. And another drew comfort from knowing that that their father, he was a uh, uh, atheist, and they took comfort in knowing that that he too would have this opportunity to to continue. In the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, make the inside the outside and the outside the inside. And that reflects exactly what you're saying there. Andrew Jackson Davis had his first self-induced experience of clairvoyance in May of 1847. As he was traveling from New York to Hudson, he could sense these changes happening within his brain, within his mind. He could sense this happening. And when he got to his friend's house, he discovered that that they were very ill, very sick. And he was moved to, to rest his hands on them. And when he did that, you know, we, we've all done healing. So we know that, you know, that when you do that, you go into this, this state of being receptive to the energy, to spirit, to those souls. And when he went into that, he went much higher. He went much deeper than what he had ever been before. And that was his first time. So we know that he has been experiencing this clairvoyant state since 1843. But during that time, from 1843 to 1847, do you think he remembered any of those experiences? No, he didn't. People would come and and ask him questions or or be have a healing or or get instructions on how to to mix up something for their health. They would come for that. But he did not remember any of it. And then one time, in the summer of 1844, he had just finished a clairvoyant session. I don't recall which operator he was with, but he had just finished that session. And Dr. Marriott, who had, had come to him on several occasions trying to, to get some information unsuccessfully, on this occasion, he handed Davis this cloudy crystal. It looked 
very much like this, except probably smaller. He handed him that crystal and told him to go into a dark place and to gaze at it. So he followed the instructions. He went into this dark place and he's gazing at this crystal and and nothing is happening. He's gazing at it, nothing is happening. And while he's gazing at it, this light begins to, to form. And then it becomes clouds. And like many of us, I know I've experienced this. I think, I think Pat may have during one of uh, uh, a impromptu class session at uh, uh, Great Wolf Lodge or something like that. There were a few people there that exper- had a an experience with clairvoyance. The first thing that he had it happened was he became frightened. So he took it back to to the doctor, gave it back to him told him what had happened, and the doctor said, well, that's normal. It won't hurt you. So during this career as a clairvoyant, before he stepped into his own, before he came into his own, he had glimpses of these clairvoyance experiences of how he could do it. Many of us will go into this by using one of these, a tool. And it's using these tools that we are able to to develop that ability ourselves. So Andrew Jackson Davis became a clairvoyant. He became what he was through dedication, perseverance, and most importantly, compassion for all. The door to this, this experience, to this clairvoyance, to to his gift, was cracked, possibly, during his younger years. Because when he was 16, he would always hear these voices. He had these voices that guided him, much like Socrates, who said that he was always in in communication with the divine. So he was was already there, and each time, with the operators, that door opened even more. And then with that compassion, that door just was opened wide and it came to him. He moved into it. He immersed himself into it. And he was able to do this on his own. And through this, he's given us many writings. He introduced us to the idea of philosophy and science within spiritualism. He, as well as as Higginston, and it's this compassion that helps us move into that. I trust that you enjoyed this. If not, tell me to be quiet, and I'll go on about my way. But before I wrap things up, 